Hi and welcome. We're going to be talking about the CIS 20 security controls or the 20 security controls put out by the Center for Internet Security. My name is William. I am a cybersecurity consultant. Um, I do a lot of penetration testing, uh, a lot of security engineering, consulting. I often refer to the CIS 20 security controls with my clients. I, I was fortunate enough to help with the newest version of the CIS 20 controls, which are soon to be released. Um, I've been part of the team working on getting, refining those controls. It's been a lot of fun uh, getting to work with a lot of smart guys. Um, and all around, I find these CIS 20 controls to be an excellent approach for dealing with the cybersecurity problem at, at your organization, at small organizations, at large organizations, and everyone in between. The first thing that you have to understand about the CIS 20 controls is the implementation groups. And let's back up a little bit before we even get into that. And where did the CIS 20 controls come from? And the CIS 20 controls were created by the NSA, the National Security Agency, as a recommendation what government organizations could do to secure their computer systems. Um, it was a list of recommendations for government organizations. And we can probably say that if the government is following these recommendations, they probably work, right? Um, the 20 controls stayed uh, confidential, um, top secret for a while uh, before the NSA passed them on to several organizations and they uh, went to SANS. They were are known by some people as the SANS 20 because SANS maintained them for a while. Um, and finally, they were handed off to the Center for Internet Security, where they are maintained today and they are public. Now, because the CIS 20 controls are meant for such a wide audience, small, large, and everything in between organizations, it can't be a granular do one, two, three, four, five, and six. So instead, the way the CIS controls are broken down, is they are broken into what's called implementation groups. And you have to self-identify and self-assess to figure out which implementation group your organization should be a part of. Now, just a quick way that you can do this is group one would be a family-owned business with around 10 employees. And they're gonna need a lot less security controls in place than group three, which was a large corporation of thousands of employees. Right, and then group two is kind of that in between, and this would be more of a regional company providing some kind of a service, or it could be, as we'll see in a few moments, a small business with 10 employees that handles confidential data, maybe a healthcare organization or something of that nature. So, to dig into implementation group one, because it's very important if you are going to follow the controls themselves that you understand the implementation group that you want to apply. So implementation group one is for small to mid-sized companies with limited IT and security expertise. Um, the principal concern of these companies is to keep the business operational, keep the business running, keep the money flowing. Um, they don't have time for a tolerance for downtime. It really affects their bottom line and they are not responsible for protecting any kind of sensitive information. So this would be a small the mom and pop shop although they have sensitive information with credit cards, so bad example. Um, any small business that doesn't have a lot of sensitive data, um, that would fall in implementation group one. And if you go pull the documents from the CIS website, they have much more criteria you can look through to figure out which level you should be at. Implementation group two, this is a company that has, they employ people who are responsible for managing and protecting IT systems. Uh, they have a dedicated IT or an IT security person. Um, they usually have different departments, an accounting department, a, if this is manufacturing, they might have a maintenance department or a engineering department. And each of these departments, because of the kind of data they have, they have different risk profile, profiles. If this is a manufacturing company, making some state-of-the-art system or technology and that they don't want public publicize their formulas, um, they have a different risk profile than the 
management group. Organizations in implementation group two may have regulatory compliance obligations that we talked about, things like HIPAA, PCI, um, any of those compliance regulations that deal with security. Another thing that can tell you that you are in this group is if you are concerned with a loss of public confidence that would arise should a breach happen at your organization. In implementation group three, they typically employ security experts who specialize in different areas of security. So there's usually a security team, not just a security person. Most of the time, these organizations have systems that contain sensitive information that is subject to regulations and compliance. Um, California Consumer Privacy, um, any of those types of regulations. And attacks at these organizations can cause harm to the public. These are implementation group three. So the CIS-20 controls are broken into three groups. Um, we have the basics, the foundational, and the organizational. Basic controls are one through six. And the way I'm gonna do this is we're gonna run through each of these controls and talk about them. Um, in our course inside of the academy, we go through each of these in much more detail. We talk about um, some of the sample attack types, attack tools and methods are at each control. Um, we'll look, in the course, we look at breach case studies, some examples of ways to automate and script the implementation and the maintenance of these. Um, that's a deep dive in our course. We're going to run through these in a lot quicker. So control number one is to create an inventory and control of hardware assets. And as a consultant, I see this all the time. Organizations don't have inventory and they don't control hardware assets. So attackers all over the world are constantly scanning your assets, looking for ways that they can attack. Port scans are happening over the internet all the time. That's what's the public facing devices. Internal devices are just as big of a risk to your organization. And being able to control and know what is in your organization is critical. We see work from home. After COVID, so many people began working from home. That, that's introduced a whole new dynamic to securing your network, your inside your perimeter, because now we have people connecting from their homes into your perimeter. And this became a quite a challenge for security professionals. We see a similar struggle with BYOD. Um, even if employees aren't bringing their, say, laptops to work off of, they're bringing their mobile devices, they're hooking up to the company Wi-Fi. Hopefully that's segmented, but it's not always. And being able to control these assets is critical. Understanding what assets you have, again, is critical. We have guests that come into the organization, and not so much in the last year because of COVID again. Um, but think about your business. You have people in and out. Do they connect to Wi-Fi? Um, do they want to use your computers or use your network to work with you on a project or something? These are things to understand and control. And this is very challenging for large networks. Truthfully, the smaller your network, the easier it is to control what's on it. The bigger it is, the easier it is to slip devices onto a network without you knowing it. So how do we keep up with what's on our network? Um, you can start with an Excel spreadsheet, going through your network, figuring out what's on it. Um, and we'll get to why this is so important to understand what's on your network in a second. You can use discovery tools that will scan your network looking for assets and create inventories for you as well. Now, when we talk about controlling, there's many, many ways to control the devices on the network. Um, disabling ports that aren't in use. Um, unique pass, uh, passwords for Wi-Fi. We can use port level access control, something like the 802.1x protocol, um, where each port is either tied to a specific MAC address or a certificate. And this is so important because when we start dealing with backups, you have to know what is where in your network, what needs backed up. When you deal with incident response, a security incident happens, we want to contain we want to begin shutting off um, all of those different zones, those interconnections, 
when we have a network with five zones, zone one becomes infected. We don't want this infection spread to those four other zones. So we go to that little choke point right there, right? And we can break that choke point and contain that infection inside of that one zone um, as part of an instant response and recovery. But knowing what is where in your network is critical to be able to even do that. Similar to controlling and inventorying your hardware, you need an inventory of authorized software on your network. And authorized software inventory should be an up-to-date list of all the authorized software used in your company environment um, that has a legitimate business purpose. Again, we want to minimize risk. If software is not needed, we don't want it. it it's a risk to our organization. So we want software that has a legitimate business purpose to be installed, and that's it. Nothing extra, no extra games, no extra radio apps, none of that. It becomes a risk to our environment. And you want to ensure that only the operating systems in use and software are operating systems and software that are currently supported by the vendor and are receiving updates. So what's the first thing that comes to mind? Windows 7. Windows 7 is end of life. It is no longer receiving updates. It is not an operating system you want to have in your organization. If in that rare case, your company is a medical organization or something similar that has a specialized machine running a built-in Windows 7 that cannot be updated because it would break the budget of the company, then take measures to severely isolate that device from the network so it can't communicate with anything. But for 95% of organizations, get rid of unsupported operating systems, get rid of unsupported software, there's a replacement somewhere that is supported. When unauthorized software is identified on the system, remove it promptly. If it's unauthorized and it's present, this means that someone installed it without permission. This person obviously does not understand the security implications or the risk of their actions. And if they don't understand the security implementations or the risk of their actions, they are probably not understanding the security maintenance, understanding updates, etc., and it becomes a risk for your organization. As an attacker, when I'm doing a pen test, and this is what attackers do, we are looking, we are scanning for known vulnerabilities that we can exploit. That's one of the first things I do once I gain access to a system. If you have software with a known vulnerability, an operating system with a known vulnerability, that's what I'm going after. It's an easy way into your organization. And when we tie our hardware inventory and the software inventory together, poorly managed machines, computers that IT has forgotten about or that user five years ago needed administrative access for some reason, they still have administrative access and IT's forgot they have administrative access and they're installing whatever software they want, that poorly managed machine is likely to have vulnerable applications that can be exploited by an attacker that can become an entry point or a pivot point into and throughout your organization. Again, just like with the hardware inventory, software inventory is super important for backups so you know what data is where, and it's super, super important for incident response. So control number three is vulnerability assessment and remediation being done continuously. It is not enough to do a annual, semi-annual vulnerability assessment. This is something that must be kept on top of to reduce that risk. And this control deals with automated operating system patch management tools. When patches are released by the operating system, apply them. If they are not automated, they should be applied in a decent time manner. Patches shouldn't be sitting out for three months before being applied unless there's a very, very good reason. Automatic software updates. When software is installed, if it has the option to do automatic updates, do it. If not, the task needs to be created and assigned to someone to keep that software up to date. Periodically run automated vulnerability scanning tools. Um, this is a service we offer for our clients. We do it re um, regularly for our clients and organizations that 
um, contract us to do it. But a vulnerability scanning tool will scan every device in your network looking for known vulnerabilities and give you a list of things you need to do to resolve them. When you conduct these vulnerability scans, it is always best to use a dedicated account so that an authenticated scan can be done. Now, when an authenticated scan is done, the scanner actually, quote, logs in, quote unquote, into the system and it gets much more data about the system. It gives you a much better picture of the security risk. When this is done, use a dedicated account for that. Don't use Bob, the IT admin's account. Set up a service account with whatever privileges are required and use that instead. You should use these scan results um, to ensure that the discovered vulnerabilities are actually being addressed and resolved in your organization. As you conduct subsequent scans, um, you should see those vulnerabilities decreasing. You shouldn't see the same vulnerability laying out for multiple times in a row, unless it requires complex remediation and there's a plan in place for that. The thing to remember about vulnerabilities, patch management inside your organization, is attackers are watching for system updates and they're looking for vulnerabilities that can become easy attack methods. I was at a training uh, a year or so ago with, with the FBI and they were talking about patch management. And the FBI's research has shown that when a patch is released for software, within 48 hours, criminals have reverse engineered that patch and figured out what the bug is that was fixed. And they're already working on creating worms or scripts or attack methods to take advantage of that. So they're working at a, that was a year ago, they're working at a 48 hour time frame. So your patches need to be faster than that. Control number four is the controlled use of administrative privileges. And this is a mistake we see organizations make all the time. And it's very easy to do if you don't understand the implications or what you're doing. Do not deploy devices onto any network with default credentials, ever. Get rid of default credentials. We just did a penetration test um, for company um, back in December. Our, this was an internal assessment. So we had a computer inside the network trying to pivot elsewhere. Our initial attack vector was Dell iDRAC, which is a remote um, access for Dell servers. Dell iDRAC had default credentials. Because it had default credentials, we were able to log on to that. We were nice hackers. We gave them some extra licensing on their remote software, allowed us to dump the hard drive, get administrative credentials, hashes, crack those, use those hashes to um, pivot throughout the network. And within a day or two, we were domain administrator, all because default credentials were left. Never, ever, ever, ever leave default credentials on any device in your network. Printers, access points, battery backups, room booking devices. We've used those in the past to get into organizations. Room booking devices with FTP access, default credentials, coffee pots, refrigerators, anything on your network. Get rid of the default credentials. Next, use dedicated administrative accounts. If you're a small company and you don't have IT, don't work in an administrative account. Make a guest user or a low level user, a regular user, and make administrative users. Um, this is easy to do if you're running something like Active Directory in a domain environment, but even on a regular Windows in a work group, you can set this up. Create a regular user who does not have administrative access, create an administrative user. Always work in the regular user account, and when you need to install software, you get that nice UAC prompt asking for a password, you put in the admin username and password, you install it and you keep going. This can mitigate so much risk. Yes, there are still ways that attackers can escalate privileges if they get access, and we do that, but you have eliminated a huge amount of risk. So let's say you're browsing the web, you click an ad, don't realize this ad is malicious, it takes you somewhere 
downloads a executable, tries to run it, you're running in a regular user account, what's it gonna do? It's either gonna fail if they try to install silently, or it's gonna prompt you for a username and password and you know something is wrong. So work in regular accounts and use administrative accounts only for administrative tasks. Keep an inventory of those administrative accounts as well. Know who are admins, who has admin access to what devices, etc. If possible, use multi-factor authentication for those administrative accounts everywhere that it is possible. Uh, that isn't always possible, but if it is, you should do it. For non-admins, limit access to scripting tools. Your regular user has no need to run, be able to interact with the Python software installed on the computer if it is. They really don't need to be able to use PowerShell. And these are huge attack vectors. Attackers, we as penetration testers, uh, if I'm able to drop onto a device, get access, that's one of the first things I'm gonna start looking for. I'm gonna look for PowerShell, Python, any kind of programming, scripting, language that I can make use of in my attack. Inside of your environment, you should create logs and alerts when new administrative accounts are added. Logging is not enough. You need a proactive alert that creates the alarm so that you know there's something that needs to be investigated. And do not store administrative credentials plain text in a script. We find this periodically during engagements. Someone will write a script to automate something in PowerShell, command line, bash, um, whatever operating system you're on, and they will hard code those credentials into that script. We find this on GitHub also. Credentials are hard coded. Never, never do that because as an attacker, I will find that. Number five is the secure configuration of hardware. The thing to understand when you get a computer, when you get a printer, when you get any device added to your network is the default credentials are designed for ease of deployment instead of security. And the unfortunate thing to keep in mind about security is ease and secure are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Typically, the easier something is, the less secure it is. The more secure it is, the less easy or the more hard it is. And as information security professionals, as an IT leader at your organization, you have to find that right balance. Where in between that is right for your organization. But default configurations are not designed for security. They're designed for easy deployment. They have open services, open ports that are not needed by your organization that need to be turned off. They have default accounts and passwords on them many times. They have vulnerable protocols allowed, telnet, um, FTP, things of that nature. They have pre-installed software that you don't need that is going to become outdated. It's going to become a vulnerability. So un having a baseline configuration in place so that when a new device is purchased, introduced into the network, these are the steps you take to bring this um, device into compliance with our baseline policies is important. You could use secure images as a template um, for building new systems, um, or you could even utilize system configuration management tools that enforce and will even redeploy configuration settings when necessary. If you're looking for some guidance on what are these configuration changes to make inside of your organization to make devices more secure, I'd recommend you start with the SIS benchmarks. Um, NIST has also put together some, um, but the SIS benchmarks are really spelled out very nicely. And you can find those on the SIS website. Um, and they will go through each operating system, each version of the operating system, and tell you exactly the configuration changes that you should make to make those systems more secure. Number six, maintenance monitoring and analysis of audio logs. So, in your environment, be sure that you activate audit logging and that you extend the retention time. We are frequently approached by organizations. We had a security incident. Can you do an investigation for us? Uh, we had just one recently. Our Office 365 was compromised 
um, where regulated industry want to do an investigation. So my first question, did you turn logging on? No, there's nothing I can do to help you. So be sure that you turn on audit logging and that you extend the retention time. I heard of a, another security consultant recently uh, doing an incident response. They were called in immediately after the incident. They'd been working for seven days, um, making progress on day eight, the retention policy reset. It was set for seven days. They lost all logs and they were back to square one. So be sure that you extend that retention time. And you want to do this for computers, servers, your cloud services, Office 365, like I mentioned, um, or Microsoft 365, this is now called. I don't know why it's logging is not turned on by default in Office 365. It makes no sense, but it's not. So if you are using that environment, be sure that you turn on audit logging. And as you build out your security program, be sure that you regularly export those audit logs to a cloud environment offsite. And be sure that those are um, those logs are tamper proof because an attacker is probably going to try to cover their tracks and get rid of logs. Again, use a central log management system um, in the cloud, preferably in more than one location is even better. Use SIMS, security, incident and event management, um, or log analytics tools that can correlate and analyze your logs looking for anomalies, security incidents. Um, if you're looking for something open source, um, the Security Onion is a great tool. The new Security Onion hybrid is really, really nice. It's got a nice GUI. Um, it brings several applications together and allows you to analyze logs, create manual alerts using the Elk Stack. Um, Elastic, Kibana, uh, Logstash um, for analyzing and creating alerts inside of your logs. And wherever possible, make your alerts proactive. All this data can go to logs, but that is for after the fact. You want to catch it as soon as it happens or stop it from happening. So as you develop your SIM or your log in that analytic tools, make proactive alerts that alert you when something goes wrong. Okay, the foundational controls, seven through 16, are the group of controls we're gonna look at next. If you have not implemented the basic controls, do those before moving on to foundational. The first control under foundational section um, is email and web browser protection. And I should tell you that as we have been working on version eight of the NIS, of the SIS 20 controls, some of these wordings will change slightly, um, but the point in what they're trying to achieve is gonna be the same. So that's something to keep in mind. Only use fully supported browsers and email clients. If you're using Chrome, use the fully supported versions. Don't use old ones. Internet Explorer, same thing. If you can, use a DNS filtering service and solution to filter malicious or known malicious um, IP addresses, um, domain names. And the reason that browsers and email clients are the first control in this group is they are actually, if you think about it, the main means by which employees interact with untrusted parties. Uh, we kind of think of, think of the systems inside of our network, inside of our perimeter as trusted, um, hopefully you're moving towards a zero trust um, outlook. But we have another course on that in the academy that you can check out if you're interested in zero trust. Hopefully you're moving towards zero trust, but if you're still stuck on the old way of thinking, we trust um, what's inside of our network. And the internet is untrusted, right? Other people's servers are untrusted. We don't know what's on them. And the way that your employees interact with that untrusted system or untrusted areas, zones, is through their browser and their email client. So they become entry points for a lot of attacks. And that's why it's so important that we secure it. So disable unnecessary browser or email client plugins. Um, if you're an Active Directory, you can limit which plugins or browser extensions are even allowed to be um, deployed. You can do this a lot of times with your endpoint management solutions as well. 
If possible, use a whitelisting approach. Only allow your employees to go to websites or services that are whitelisted. Everything else is blocked. Log URL requests. This becomes very important um, if you need to do an incident investigation. Um, and finally, set up email authentication. SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. They are not the end-all email security because they are mostly for people who, who are receiving your emails. Um, but if we all go implement it, we all help each other and we all become better off. Control number eight is malware defense. You need to use an anti-malware software and ensure that it is regularly updated. I would recommend using one of the more modern solutions, the ones that are uh, behavioral based, not necessarily signature based. Um, you kind of stand a better chance of catching solutions faster, but have some kind of anti-malware software and be sure that it's regularly updated um, to catch attacks. Automatically scan removable media devices. If you are allowing USBs, can be a bad idea. They are a risk, but if you need to use them, automatically scan them with whatever your anti-malware system you use. Configure your devices like USBs to not auto run any content on them. Um, try to use a centrally managed anti-malware software where you have one location you control it all. Um, these, a lot of times these have features like isolation. If a device is infected, it is isolated and not able to talk on the network. Then use operating system anti-exploitation features, things like um, data execution prevention, um, address space layout randomization, ASLR. Um, this stops attackers from writing scripts, their own executables to run malware in, um, in your organization. Try to enable DNS query logging. Uh, this can find d malicious domain lookups for C2 um, infrastructure or command and control where a malware is a slave and it has to reach out to its command or control server rather to figure out what commands to execute, when to execute them. And finally, audit command line activity. PowerShell, Bash, etc. Um, these are where attackers play. This is how they try to pivot. So monitor that very closely. Control number nine, limit network ports, protocols, and services. On every host, if it has a host-based firewall or port filtering, turn it on. There's really no need for devices inside your network to communicate. Bob's computer doesn't need to talk to Sally's computer. And again, if you're moving towards a zero trust, um, this is something to implement. Very important. Ensure that only approved port protocols and services are open. Regularly conduct port scans so that you can find any unauthorized changes early. And segment your servers and your sensitive systems via application firewalls. Again, back to the zoning and the no trust mentality. We want to segment our network into as many small pieces as possible so that should something happen to one area of our network, it can't spread like wildfire. Control number 10 is data recovery capabilities. We need to be sure that system data is automatically backed up on a regular basis. We want automat We also want to automate the periodic imaging of critical servers and systems. Um, yes, we might have file backups, but if you can um, create per images periodically, that those will become easier restore points and then you can add the files on top of it. Ensure backup security. Be sure that backups are encrypted and they are in a secure environment. Keep multiple forms of backup when possible. Have an online and an offline backup. If you've got a 10 terabyte server stored in the cloud with a 20 meg internet connection, what's going to happen when you need to restore from that backup? It's going to take you a long, long time to restore it. And finally, regularly test your backups. Um, there, there's nothing worse than having a security incident, losing data, going to restore it and realize, oh, backups haven't been working for the last three weeks. We don't have any of that data. So test your backups regularly. Control number 11 is secure configuration of network devices. Um, you want to use the latest stable so application and firmware version on all of your network devices. Um, because again, 
out of date, it means vulnerabilities, it means exploits for attackers. Maintain standard security configurations so that when a new, say, network switch is added, you know this is the configuration that needs to be applied to it. Document your traffic configuration rules. Having that handy is important when you come to do an incident containment, incident response, knowing how data is flowing can help you in your investigation. If you can, use multi-factor authentication on your devices. Use encrypted sessions. Um, a lot of the name brand switches used to not have encrypted sessions, and that was always aggravating me. I had to use HTTP to interact with them instead of HTTPS. Um, use dedicated workstations for network administrative tasks. Um, yeah, keep a computer dedicated for network admin work um, or keep an account dedicated for that to use. And then finally, manage your network infrastructure from a dedicated VLANer segment. Um, again, we want to reduce the amount of spread possible for attackers and bring those zones as small as possible. We don't want a big flat network. Control number 12 is boundary defense. You need to keep an updated inventory of your network boundaries. If you're a small organization, this might be simple. You might have one boundary point, only one way in and out of your network. If you're a large organization with multiple locations, you might have more boundaries. Um, I was um, reading a book not too long ago um, about the Moonlight Maze attacks on the government um, back in the 90s. And when they did their incident response um, and began investigating, they found that the military back then had hundreds of network boundaries that they didn't even know about. So keeping that inventory is very important. Deny communications over unauthorized ports. Again, this goes back to our whitelist approach. Only allow what's needed. Deny communications with known malicious IPs. Most of your modern firewalls and every business, no matter how small you are, you should have a real firewall. Um, the firewall that comes inside of your, the modem or whatever they give you is no good. They're easy to exploit, easy to bypass. Get a, you can get a nice firewall for not terribly expensive. And most of them will have some kind of um, system or that allows them to block known malicious IPs. As you move into some of the higher impl implementation groups, group two and three, you can begin logging network, pass, network packets that pass through your boundaries, um, just running something like a T-Shark or a Wireshark capture um, on those can become useful for investigations and analysis later. And if possible, require multi-factor authentication and the encryption of data in transit for any remote login access solutions. Control number 13 is data protection. First and foremost, you need a data inventory. Every organization needs a data inventory. If you collect PII, or personally identifiable information, sensitive information, if you store it, process it, or transmit it for your own company's use, for any of your business partner's use, you need a data inventory. You need to sit down, figure out what data you collect, where you collect it, how it comes into your organization, where it's stored in your organization, how it's processed and moved around your organization, and how it leaves your organization. And then you can begin focusing your security on these points. Um, where this data is transiting in and out. Remove unneeded sensitive information. Don't just keep sensitive information laying around. We see all of these huge news stories about X million um, records were leaked online during X of uh, this breach. Did they really need all of that data? Probably not. There's probably a lot of data in there that they could go get rid of and they could reduce the amount of risk that should something happen, the amount of data that could be leaked. You do a service for your customers. You do a service to them when you get rid of their data if you don't need it. Your marketing team's probably gonna say, we need that data, we can do X, Y, and Z with it. Is it really any good? If you're not using it, get rid of it. Unless you're in a regulated industry like healthcare where you have to keep that data for X amount of years. After that, get rid of it. 
you get, try to use solutions that look for unauthorized transfers of sensitive information, as well as encrypting any data stored on mobile devices, laptops, tablets, smartphones. If it moves, it should be encrypted is what I like to say. Monitor your outbound network traffic for sensitive information being leaked. And if using USB storage, use solutions that only allow certain USB devices. And you can do this with um, Microsoft's built-in encryption solution. Um, you can encrypt USB devices, um, limit them by uh, device information so that only certain actual USB devices are allowed. Control number 14 is controlled access based on the need to know. And this is very important because it's really easy for people at small organizations to get, let everyone have access to everything. Yes, you might trust your employees. Yes, they might be trustworthy. But do they need access to that, do their job? There's likely stuff they don't need access to. And the more access we can limit, the less an attacker has if they are able to compromise our system or a user. So protect your information through access control list. Um, this goes for network shares, applications, databases, anywhere that has an access control list, use it. Restrict access to that data. We want as little as possible to do our jobs. Segment your network based on sensitivity. If you have high sensitivity data that is collected, store it in a separate network segment. And then use firewall filtering between those VLANs or segments to inspect that traffic. And finally, disable workstation to workstation communication. We discussed this earlier, but there are very, very few times when Bob and Sally's laptops need to be able to talk to each other or their workstations. IT might have a need for it. So yeah, you might have to leave it for them. But for everyone else, get rid of workstation to workstation communication. If I'm an attacker and I'm able to drop a shell on one workstation and I can't get to any other workstation, that makes my job a lot harder. Control number 15 is wireless device security. Most companies are using wireless networks today. And if you think about it, wireless networks are your most exposed network because I don't have to be inside of your building to connect to it. Um, again, a quick story. I've done penetration tests before where I was doing wireless penetration tests and I didn't even have to be in the building to get on. Um, many times I have parked in parking decks next to buildings and caught Wi-Fi signals from the parking deck. I've impersonated their um, wireless networks and as employees are walking by on their way into work through the parking deck, um, their phone in their pocket, their tablet in their bag would see my fake Wi-Fi connect to it, I'd get their username and password. So like, Wi-Fi is a vulnerable part of your network. So use WPA2 encryption, not WEP. Use at least AES encryption um, with corporate or enterprise WPA2. Um, you could use something like username and password, certificate-based, um, any of the above, but at least have AES encryption with a password, a shared key. Make sure you have an inventory of authorized wireless access points and you have an ability to detect new wireless access points. And this go, that goes more for um, group two and group three. Um, but as you move into those groups, you want to be able to be able to detect um, rogue access points or people doing like the things I talked about in that card deck. And finally, uh, like with computers, disable peer-to-peer -peer wireless communication. Control 16, we're getting close to the end, is account monitoring and control. First of all, lock workstations after a set period of inactivity. Set them to log out. Disable dormant accounts. If a user account is not needed, get rid of it. When someone leaves the company, their account should be terminated, if possible, before they walk out the front door to the parking lot. Set up policies. When HR is going to redo it, termination they give you a x hour heads up your team disables that account while they're in the meeting before they get back to their desk disable accounts that are not associated with a particular process service or owner um, as organizations grow it's easier to get orphaned accounts audit these get rid of them they become a risk for your organization 
Then once an account is disabled, monitor attempts to log in with that disabled account. Um, one way that we recommend sometimes for catching attacks early is, or a honeypot method we've sort of come up with is create fake profiles on LinkedIn. Then you can disable those accounts or audit them for heavily. And then when someone tries to log in with that fake account, you know it's malicious and something's up. Keep an inventory of accounts correlated with certain access so that when someone is terminated and you terminate their account, maybe they have access to your GitHub account or something that else that needs terminated. Um, try to use a centralized point of authentication. This becomes very important as you move towards a zero trust architecture inside of your environment. Coming to a central point of authentication, using single sign-on, et cetera, so that everything ties back to one authentication system. Then we verify that with multi-factor authentication, and then we give them access to as little as possible. And with that, if you can use multi-factor authentication with it, do so. Um, and then, as your organization grows, try to create alerts of user activity that deviates from the normal. Things like time of day, workstation, location, duration, etc. And again, as you move into a zero trust architecture, which hopefully you are considering it, if you don't know what that is, um, we have videos training about it completely free. When we look at authentication in zero trust, we're looking at the where, the what, the how, the when, the why, and the who. Where is the person? What are they trying to access? Why are they trying to access it? The when, what time of day? Who, who does this user claim to be? How, what applications are they using, et cetera. And we get granular on all of that. The next set of controls, the last set are the organizational controls. This is how CIS out, CIS, the Center for Internet, the Center for Internet Security has outlined them. I disagree with this order slightly, and I will explain that in a second. But we had basic controls, then we had foundational. Now we move to organizational controls, and this is where I disagree with the Center for Internet Security. I believe security awareness training and assessments should be inside of those basic controls because it's free. It can be free. There are solutions you can pay for, but there are free ways to do it. And if you implement good security awareness in your organization, you turn your employees into your helpers. And they see something suspicious, they know who to report to. They know to help you. Their behavior changes. They're less likely to become the problems in the entry point. Create a security awareness program for all workforce members that trains them regularly. As we have done penetration tests, social engineering engagements over the years, we have found something very interesting. We've always been a big proponent of regular security awareness training because out of sight, out of mind. If you're training your employees once a year, you're taking them to the break room with a boring one hour presentation, how likely are they to remember that in eight months? Not very. But if you can keep them engaged with short training that regularly occurs constantly, it's in sight, it's in mind, they're more likely to think about it. You need to train all workforce members. Board level, management, they're not exempt. Attackers try to go after them. Attackers actually target them, sometimes more so than regular users. They need training as well. Train your employees how to spot these attacks. I mean, back to what I was saying is as we've done these social engineering, social engineering engagements, we have found organizations that do regular training are harder to social engineer than organizations that do annual training. So train your employees how to identify social engineering attacks, things like phishing, phone scams, impersonation, et cetera. They need to be able to identify it and they need to know who to report it to. Train them how to store, transfer, archive, and destroy sensitive information. They need to know what to do, how to handle it. They need to know who to report these things to. They need to understand that you're not going to get in trouble for reporting this incident. We want you to report it. And finally, conduct testing 
phishing um, simulations, etc., to ensure that your employees are actually making secure decisions and they're actually understanding the material that you are teaching them. Control number 18 deals with application software security. And this control focuses on organizations that are developing software in-house. Um, there are a few things that might fit other organizations, but that's what it's focused on. And number one, use secure coding practices that are appropriate for the programming language um, and the development environment that you are using. Understand secure coding practices. Um, understand what leads to things like buffer overflows so that you don't build buffer overflows into your code. Um, use explicit error checking for in-house developed software. Um, ensure that all software acquired by the organization, things software you purchase um, or use is supported like we mentioned earlier. Um, use, if you are doing any kind of encryption or trying to secure um, data, don't make up your own encryption algorithms. Use a standardized and a reviewed algorithm inside of your code. Um, try to apply static and dynamic code analysis tools to verify code security. And for databases and other components, use system hardening configuration templates. Control number 19 is incident response and management. And you've probably heard it. If not, I'm going to tell you. It's not when you will be breached. It's not if you will be breached, rather. It's when will you be breached. So when you are breached, you will have to respond to that incident. So having an incident response plan in place is important. Create a written incident response plan that defines the roles um, of personnel as well as the phases of incident handling. Know exactly who caused a security incident. Who makes that call? A security incident has happened. We go into contain mode. Who is it that has that authority? What are the phases that you are going to move through during an incident? If you're following NIST, we're dealing with identifying, responding, containing, um, detecting, then containing rather, um, and then cleanup and remediation. Designate the proper management and leadership personnel who handle incidents. Um, and again, like we said, those key decisions that have to be made, have someone dedicated for that. Be sure that you have contact information to be used for incidents. Know your law enforcement contacts, government departments, vendors, information security partners, um, the employees inside of your company. Have all of that. I recommend having a digital and a hard copy. If it's a physical disaster of some kind that causes an incident, um, maybe affecting availability, having that contact information printed out up to date can be very helpful. Be sure that you publish information so that your employees know who the proper channels are for reporting security incidents. Who should they report to? Um, and then finally, conduct periodic tests that test your incident response plans. Do tabletop exercises. Do mock incidents um, that test. Do employees know how to respond? Do they know the proper communication channels? Do they know proper escalation methods, etc.? And finally, the final control is penetration testing and red team exercises. Um, this is short control, but very, very important. Create programs or plans for using penetration tests um, to test your security, to test your incident response, to test your security approach. Make sure these tests include a full scope of attack types. Don't always limit your penetration test to wireless pen tests, for example. we Every year we get a wireless pen test. What about the other ways in the organization? What about social engineering? What about internal attacks, insider threats? Include all of these in your attacks. Um, and then regularly conduct internal external penetration testing. Get a third party, someone who knows what they're doing, to conduct these tests for you, give your report, help walk you through what attacks they were able to pull off, how they were able to do it. So that wraps up the SIS-20 controls. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, 
our course in the academy, we in our course in the academy, we go into much more detail on each of these controls. Um, we took a look at the attacks that can happen. Um, we look at ways to automate and script them, tools that are in use. So be sure to check that out.